there are some cancers, for example, pancreatic, lung, and even brain, that are not detected early enough to be able to save the person's life. And these are three very, very bad cancers. If you can detect it early, you can save the person's life. Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation podcast. Join us and be inspired by the incredible stories of those who have faced cancer with strength and resilience and the medical professionals who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and ultimately a cure. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer. It's about the human side of this disease. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Welcome to the Believe in Progress podcast featuring Dr. Margaret Foti, who is joining us here at the AACR headquarters in Philadelphia. Dr. Margaret Foti is the Chief Executive Officer of the AACR. Under her visionary leadership, the AACR's membership has grown from about 3,000 members to over 54,000 in 130 countries and territories. She also helped increase the AACR's portfolio of peer-reviewed scientific journals from 1 to 10. After beginning her AACR career in an editorial position with the Journal of Cancer Research, Dr. Foti progressed through several key editorial and management roles in scientific publishing to become the AACR's chief executive officer. She launched nine additional major peer-reviewed scientific journals. She also helped launch Cancer Today, a magazine for cancer patients, survivors, and their families and caregivers. Dr. Foti is a proud graduate of Temple University and one of the most influential voices in advancing the field of cancer research, both in the United States and abroad. She was elected president of three professional societies in scholarly publishing and in cancer research. She has also served as a board member, committee member, and consultant to a number of other nonprofit organizations. Under Dr. Foti's leadership, the AACR has served with distinction as the scientific partner of Stand Up to Cancer. In this capacity, Dr. Foti and the AACR staff have brought significant expertise to their work with Stand Up to Cancer, especially in the scientific peer review of projects, scientific project management, grants administration, communications, and science policy. In 2019, she was honored as one of the women of inspiration and influence by the women business leaders of the U.S. Healthcare Industry Foundation. She was also recognized with the 2018 Women for Oncology Award from the European Society for Medical Oncology. In 2007, the AACR established the first AACR Margaret Foti Award for Leadership and Extraordinary Achievements in Cancer Research, which is given annually in her name. Her visionary leadership, combined with her steadfast focus on the AACR's mission, continues to drive the field forward towards the vital goal of preventing and curing all cancers. Well, Dr. Foti, um, I can't tell you how excited I am for this podcast today. Uh, welcome to Believe in Progress. Um, it, I'm so excited to have you here and uh, be part of our show. Um, you are the Chief Executive Officer of the American Association for Cancer Research, uh, an organization that I'm, I'm immensely proud to work with and, and work with you. Um, and uh, just so happy to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Mitch. Uh, it's really great to be with you uh, here and uh, knowing that you are making uh, great strides here as the Chief Philanthropic Officer of the ACR Foundation. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Marge. So, Marge, um, <laughs> I know this because I've known you for a number of years. You, uh, you, you're, you grew up in Philadelphia. Can you tell us a little bit about your roots? You grew up in, in South Philly, I believe. That's right. I was uh, born and raised in South Philadelphia, where a lot of little Italian girls grew up. <laughs> and uh, my parents were first generation in this country. And, um, and it's, uh, it's exciting to see what, what uh, the Italian community has been able to do uh, for, for all of us in this country. My grandparents were uh, very excited uh, to, uh, to work with us and be with us. And uh, my grandfather in particular liked the, the fact that I could play the accordion, which reminded him of the old country. Ah. So did, did they teach you that? You taught that, you, you, you took lessons for the accordion? I took lessons for a long time, yes. You still play? Uh, no, but I, I did have some exciting moments playing for the mayor and, and some really? other. Yes, it was really what, what thrilling. Mayor, which mayor? Mayor Dilworth, and uh. Uh, also for the USO and, uh, 
and and for the Italian consul. So it was really a special moment in my That's life. That's really cool. And, and you went to you went to university here in Philadelphia as well. Yes, I'm a graduate of Temple University. Uh, I have several degrees from Temple now, and I'm very very proud of what they're doing and. I work with them all the time to uh, do even more there. So, uh, in communications in particular. So, um, you have a storied career. Um, you're a wonderful leader, um, and I'm really curious about how you got started in cancer in in the field of cancer, if you will. I, I don't think that's how you first sought out a career, but I'm just kind of curious what, what the progression was and and how you kind of moved into a role at AACR? Well, thank you for asking. It's, it was certainly accidental uh, for me when I first graduated from St. Maria Goretti High School in South Philly. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do from a career standpoint. And uh, my mother was very anxious that I would go to university, but I wasn't really sure yet what I wanted to do with my career. So uh, she uh, insisted that I go to the University of Pennsylvania to work there so that I could go to school at night. So my first job was um, uh, to work at the University of Pennsylvania Moore School of Electrical Engineering, where I uh, met a number of computer scientists who were at the top of their field. They had come from the computing lab at Harvard, and it was very exciting to be with them and to see their excitement about, about their work. And so I, um, as a young person, I led a, a department of 13 graduate students and five faculty members and, and, and my boss. And, um, and I observed what it's, what, how excited uh, scientists can get, irrespective of their field, about discoveries. Um, so from there, I, uh, so I started, to take, uh, started taking courses at night at, at uh, university, uh, both in business but also political science. And I fancied myself um, in being an attorney at that juncture. Um, but after I got to the top of my classification at the University of Pennsylvania, I, I decided I would look at other opportunities, and I applied for an editorial position at uh, the AACR as an editorial assistant for the journal, the flagship journal of, of AACR called uh, Cancer Research. And I got the job. I didn't have my degree yet, um, and um, I was happy to do it, but they, they liked the fact that I had done a lot of editing and, at, at uh, Moore School. What caught your attention to even apply for that job? What, what got your, you know? Well, it, it was the, uh, the advertisement actually was uh, very compelling. Mm -hmm. It uh, talked about how important it, uh, cancer research is, and, um, and that, that motivated me to, to apply. And of course, I liked editing, and I thought I could do it, and... Uh, and, um, and the editor-in-chief at that time, whose uh, name was uh, Dr. Michael Shimkin, who had been the prior NCI director, felt that I could do the job, and he was very encouraging. And, um, and there it was. I was. So I was editorial assistant for four years, and then I was made managing editor at the age of 24. Um, couldn't believe that. You still uh, going to school at the time? So, yes, wow. I was still going to school at night. I did all my, my work, uh, my university uh, courses at night. And then um, about a decade later, they asked me to be the first CEO of the AACR, and I was stunned but thrilled and humbled <laughs> right. to take the position. And what was the size of the AACR at that time when you were, the, you were just bec becoming the, uh, the first CEO? Uh, we had 3,000 members uh, in uh, maybe 10, 15 countries. And uh, now we have over 54,000 members in 131 countries. Um, it was uh, much smaller then and, uh, and um, not as much work. Now we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Round the clock, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I know you've had some personal experiences with cancer. Um, you also um, do a heck of a lot of work, you know, on some off hours as a patient navigator. If you don't mind, would you tell people about how cancer has, I guess, touched you and your family personally, and then maybe touch a little bit on the patient navigation in, in your eyes, why that's so important and, um, you know, why you take that on as much as you do? Well, I mean, to be honest, although I had been working in the field for a while, we had never really been exposed to cancer in our family to any great extent. There may have been you know, long distance cousins, we didn't uh, really see. Uh, but for the most part, I had not seen it in, directly in my family. 
And when my sister was diagnosed uh, with late stage ovarian cancer, um, it was pretty shocking to me and something that really um, had a, a, an amazing impact on me. Um, I could see the devastation of the disease, uh, the, the difficulties she had with uh, the treatments, uh, but she was a tough person and she got through it. And, um, and it, now this year, she's celebrating her 25th anniversary of being um, cancer free. That's great. And so that, that really ha was thrilling for me to watch. Um, and, and I must say that it, it's all due to cancer research and the breakthroughs and the, the therapeutics that they had available even at that time that allowed her to be cured. Of course, it's, she's not, uh, she's, she was um, lucky, uh, but we all already now have uh, a cousin of mine who has uh, pancreatic cancer who's struggling with that, uh, younger than I am. And so there's so much more work to be done in this field, and right. that's what motivates us uh, to work very hard. To right. Credit. So people call on you all the time uh, to help them and, and, and counsel them and give them ad ideas. Again, patient navigation. Yes. Uh, could you tell our audience a little bit about um, your own role with patient navigation, but the importance of patient navigation as well? Yes, well, it's something that we're doing increasingly. Um, uh, previously, uh, we had not done as much, but now we see the value. And certainly as, a, as the CEO of this organization, I myself feel very strongly there's a responsibility uh, to respond to an inquiry from patients uh, asking, well, what kind of clinical trials can I get into? What, where, where can I get the best care for a, a particular cancer that they're facing? And so uh, I, I'm doing a lot of this now, and and I think going forward, um, you know, we're seriously considering having a website so that we can do uh, more. Uh, but most importantly, we're saving one life at a time, which is really very thrilling for me. Right. Any is there any particular story that you can reflect on of of patient navigation or anybody that you've helped and uh, because of your help and counsel, they're they're doing they're thriving now. Well, pro the one I can recall is um, uh, that of a friend whose, um, whose aunt was very sick, serious breast cancer. Uh, you know, there are multiple types of, of breast cancer, and so we had to make sure that she got to the, to the right uh, oncologist who knew something about that particular type of breast cancer. So uh, she's living today, and I'm thrilled that, uh, that I had a, a role in it, that's, a minor role, of that's course. That's fantastic. Um, let's chat about ACR for a minute or two. Um, the ACR annual meeting is the, uh, the flagship event for this organization. Um, but it was a much smaller meeting 20 years ago, 25 years ago to what it is today. Talk about the significance of this unbelievable scientific meeting and, and what it means to the field at large. Well, the annual meeting is the centerpiece of everything we're doing in, in cancer research, uh, both nationally and internationally. We have, uh, when you think about the fact that we now have um, uh, maybe 22,000 attendees, but um, about a third of them are from outside the U.S. So it's a global uh, activity uh, that really um, uh, serves the needs of uh, not only the most the senior people who need to be together and hundreds and hundreds of presentations, but also um, it serves the needs of the junior, fac junior uh, uh, scientists who want to present their latest uh, results in poster sessions. And we receive thousands of those abstracts uh, for presentations. So it's a huge activity. Uh, years ago, when I was first starting, we could actually fit into a, a hotel. Really? One and, hotel? Uh, yes. <laughs> And uh, there were maybe a thousand, you know, attendees. And now we take over a whole city and, right. and a, a large convention centers. So there are multiple uh, sessions going on, um, many, hundreds of presentations, uh, plenary sessions. Um, one very important thing that we're growing is um, plenary sessions that are presenting very cutting edge clinical trials. And then we show the science behind those trials because obviously one of the benefits of the AACR is that we cover all the sciences going from laboratory all the way to the clinic. So when we, when we uh, present a major breakthrough, we can talk about exactly what went into that scientifically in order to deliver that breakthrough to the patient. So that, all that happens at the annual meeting and I'm uh, thrilled to be able to oversee it. 
um, uh, always is now five days long with many educational sessions as well as major sessions. And next year, our annual meeting is going to be in San Diego. Yes. Um, and we think we'll surpass 22,000 people. Absolutely. Um, and it'll be, again, a, a remarkable meeting. And we, we move our meetings around every year. Is that correct? That's correct. But right now, there may be seven or eight cities in the country that can accommodate uh, our large uh, meeting. And, uh, and we try to diversify those venues. And so next time is in San Diego. And um, related to the annual meeting, talk about the volunteerism um, that really makes the meeting go. You know, the, the spirit of the, the scientists that are really volunteering their time to, to make this event so spectacular. What I think what is uh, very interesting for me to observe is the fact that whenever we ask a prominent scientist, um, let's say, whether it be uh, someone in the laboratory or the clinic, they always say yes uh, to, uh, to serve, um, whether they be advisors in the scientific content that is being presented at the meeting, or they're helping with um, education training of young investigators. Uh, there's an enormous interest to help the AACR, and we're very, um, very pleased and very happy that we have such a, a constituency of interested individuals who are so dedicated uh, to the field and dedicated to the to helping the AACR bring all that about. So I uh, I think volunteerism uh, we we couldn't do without it actually. And I and every year we have about a thousand volunteers on various committees uh, that. Um, work to advance certain areas of the field. That's amazing. And these are <laughs> these are dedicated scientists that are working around the clock already, right? And they're Absolutely. giving us that much more of their time. You know, you've told me uh, that in the past, you think the AACR has played such a pivotal role in the careers of many of these scientists and doctors. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, I think uh, in so many ways. First of all, if you give uh, young investigators a chance to um, uh, give a presentation at a meeting where there are hundreds, if not thousands of people in the audience, that alone uh, catapults a, 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 a career, uh, gets their name out there, people see that, they have job opportunities if someone is in the audience who's interested in that particular area of cancer research. Mm -hmm. So the presentation is important, of course. The other thing that's that's equally important and perhaps even more important is our ability to uh, get research grants to individuals who are uh, doing great work. And of course, your work as the chief philanthropic officer is very important in that regard to raise funds and be able to uh, be able to fund the, the best science, uh, whether it be for senior, uh, but even more importantly, junior investigators who need to have grants um, early in their career. And what we've seen now is with those research grants, 10, 15 years later, they're full professors and they're, and they're working in various sectors of the field, whether it be academia, industry, um, uh, philanthropic organizations. They're just doing fabulous work uh, later on in, in life. And we, we're very proud that we've started that early and, on. And, and in the words of uh, one of our past presidents, uh, Dr. Caligiuri, no, no money, no mission. And there's a lot of truth to, to that statement. Um, and, and, Philanthropy does play an important role in, in the AACR and, and in cancer research in general. Um, we really appreciate your support. Um, you know, I've been here 10 years now, and um, the, the foundation started about 21, 22 years ago uh, because of your vision and Dr. Clarkson's vision. Um, do you remember discussions with Dr. Clarkson about why the foundation should start? Yes, uh, I certainly do. Uh, by the way, Dr. Clarkson, uh, next month is having his 97th birthday. I heard, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> and he still cares about us and calls and wants to know what we're doing and is supportive and um, thrilled about what you're accomplishing. Yes, the it's very, very important to raise uh, funds for cancer research, uh, for grant research grants, as I said. Um, for various fields that are that are really need support, but even more importantly, uh, right now, uh, the federal government is leveling off and, in fact, um, lowering its uh, contributions to medical research, and philanthropic dollars become even more important 
to the community in order to be able to keep the research going. So um, I can only say that uh, our role, um, and even at that ba back then in, in, in the beginning of the century, but also now has become even more important in order to be able to fund research and avoid these young people leaving the field because they're not getting grants. So right now, um, about 11% Sadly, only 11% of the meritorious uh, grant applications are funded, but it's, people are worried that that will go down below 11%, maybe 7 or 8% in the right. next couple of years. It's outrageous, really, that uh, we can only do that. And so think about all the great ideas that, that either both junior and senior investigators have that are, that are going unfunded. And so we don't want to lose the, um, the, the young people who are interested in cancer research. I, I didn't mention the fact that 54% of our membership is in the young investigator category, and another 4% are high school and undergraduate students. Right. So there's a large cohort of individuals in our membership uh, who really want to stay in the field, but if they can't get funding, and they can't get jobs, they will leave to go to other other uh, opportunities. And that would be very unfortunate for cancer patients. It's our responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen, right? I mean, that, Absolutely. That's, what really, uh, uh, that's what we really have to work hard to make sure that doesn't happen. I, I, I remember this past annual meeting, um, I was at one of the uh, events and the young scientist um, you know, just came up to me and, and thanked us for either research grant awards or uh, scholar and training awards. And it was so gratifying. And, um, you know, it, it really kind of puts your job into perspective how important it is, you know, the work we do. Um, Dr. Fodi uh, also is a, uh, she puts her money where her mouth is and she supports the organization uh, big time. But she also um, uh, gives money to uh, these scholar and training awards. Could, could you just ch chat a little bit about why that's important, do you think? Well, scholar and training awards uh, are really travel awards to come to our uh, important meetings. Now, meetings, um, uh, you know, stopped during the pandemic, and it was very sad because a lot of people were really uh, feeling that they were not getting the information about cancer research as actively as they, um, they used to. And in the hallways of meetings, particularly the annual meeting, um, accidental uh, uh, opportunities come along where someone might mention um, an interesting idea about how to, let's say, um, a cure a particular type of cancer. And, um, and, and that uh, really stimulates a new idea. So when you think about it, innovation is uh, happening at the annual meeting and you must get young people to be able to come to the meeting. So being able to raise the funds to be able to bring those young people to the meeting and have them interact with the most senior of colleagues is absolutely essential for advances in cancer research. Well, uh, thank you so much for your support of that. I really appreciate it. You mentioned COVID. Um, and uh, I must say that was a really challenging time for the organization. Um, and as the chief executive officer, you really had to navigate um, a, a number of issues, including an, an annual meeting. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of, of, of that period and, and then maybe even, you know, go on and talk a little bit about the challenges to the research community at large? And I think we're still making up for lost time there. Well, of course, we had to uh, cancel our meeting with only six weeks notice, which was uh, very sad, yeah. actually. And, um, and when you think about the importance of the annual meeting, you, you have to think about how people were calling me crying that they, couldn't, they could no longer come to the annual meeting in person. And so for several years, obviously, our, we had to do this uh, remotely uh, online. Of course, Zoom helps, but it doesn't help that accidental finding that I was talking about. And so we struggled through, um, through the uh, pandemic period. Now we're so happy to be back together. Um, and I think uh, we'll feel really good uh, moving forward um, with our meetings in person. Um, and 92% of the people who attended our 2023 uh, meeting um, came in person. Right. So, uh, so it's clear that people want to be together. Uh, the others were at home and were not as happy <laughs> right, right. in my view. 
Um, but, you know, even uh, when you think about uh, the effect of COVID on research, I mean, there, there have been situations where clinical trials have not been able to uh, be activated because of personnel not being able to be in the facilities. And although there are new things like telehealth uh, that have come along to help with that, it's not, not the same. And so uh, there are still um, negative aspects of, of the pandemic that we're dealing with. But overall, it's been impressive that um, we've been able to somehow weather the storm and we're back to a reasonable status now. So there's some, been some amazing breakthroughs in cancer research. Um, what, what do you think, um, I mean, what do you think is the future look like? You know, um, I mean, it certainly seems promising. I'm a lay person, but from your perspective, um, can you tell the audience a little bit about what your thoughts are, where, where the next breakthroughs are going to come from, and you know, where do you think we're going to go from here? Well, I think, first of all, there's been an enormous understanding of cancer biology um, that has really led us to be able to do what is called precision oncology. And so now we know how to um, target the particular mutation in the tumor and apply the appropriate therapeutic to that tumor to be able to save the person's life. So precision oncology is extremely active now in the field. And it's something that, um, that I think will continue to flourish. We have meetings on that uh, every year, not only in the US, but also in Asia, in Korea and in Japan uh, and elsewhere. So I think that um, moving forward, we'll see this even uh, become even more, uh, more prominent um, immunotherapy is a very exciting new field uh, that um, we are seeing now advancing very rapidly. There's something called a checkpoint inhibitor that literally uh, uh, releases the brakes on, on T cells that are cancer fighting cells and, and allows the therapeutic to uh, become active and, and cure the patient. And so there's been enormous advances in that area and continuing uh, so. Um, in 2011, for example, there was only one checkpoint inhibitor approved by the FDA, and, and in 2022, uh, there were nine. So you can see this, this acceleration of advances in that, that field alone. And then there's something called liquid biopsies, which is really um, something, of course, that uh, President Biden has been talking about, early detection. Very, very important to detect the cancer early in order to be able to save the person's life. And liquid biopsies um, are being studied very, very rapidly. There's a whole group of about 50 different institutions in Europe that are focused on liquid biopsies only to really be able to detect the, the cancer in the blood uh, without having to do invasive bio biopsies. And, um, and so that, uh, along with other um, uh, early detection uh, methodologies um, is really, um, moving very rapidly in, in, in terms of uh, helping uh, the field. New technology, other new technologies like uh, artificial intelligence and um, something called CRISPR, things of that nature are um, really moving forward. I just got back from a, from a meeting in Trento, Italy, where for three days they talked about new technologies for studying and treating cancer. An enormously exciting uh, conference led by a Nobel laureate, a member of AACR, Dr. Bill Kalin, and um, and I came out of that f uh, conference filled with excitement about the opportunities in, in in new technologies, and then of course identifying risk factors. Uh, we have um, we know now that. Um, uh, of course, to, we've always known that tobacco is a very bad carcinogen, um, but also alcohol, um, a bad, poor diet, um, obesity, uh, being responsible for 15 different cancers. Mm -hmm. These are things we're tracking very carefully so as to do more in cancer prevention. You mentioned um, somebody in your family is dealing with pancreatic cancer. And I know early detection is a really big thing for us at the AACR to, to, to get, get inv continue to be involved with. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of early detection? Absolutely. I mean, there are some cancers, for example, pancreatic, lung, and even brain 
that are not detected early enough to be able to save the person's life. And these are three very, very bad cancers mm -hmm. that if you, can, if you can detect it early, you can save the person's life. So early detection, whatever, whatever the methodology, is going to be very important to saving more lives from cancer. Look, we've done a, a lot in progress against cancer. There's been a 32% reduction in the cancer death rate since 1991. Um, and they we're very proud of that, but um, there are, after all, over 200 different cancers and thousands of subtypes. Right. And so we need to understand what's, what uh, actually starts these cancers, what causes them, um, how we can catch it early so that we can um, uh, save the person's life and early detection is absolutely essential. So Marge, you talked about um, high school students and undergraduate students and um, you know, what kind of advice would you give uh, young people that are might be seeking a career in 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 the cancer field? Well, I think for one thing, um, you know, uh, one should talk to one's advisors uh, early on to be able to um, uh, to try to see uh, whether that uh, whether the uh, the field is really what one might be interested in. I think uh, uh, what is interesting to me is that uh, young people, whether they are looking, whether they are studying biology, chemistry, physics, or even a an allied field, um, really um, uh, can get exposed to cancer, uh, cancer research, and 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 its potential. I I hope that people will look to the AACR for opportunities in early education and training. Uh, so that they can, you know, test this out and see whether um, whether cancer research is where they want to go, because obviously the workforce going forward is going to be very, very important. And we need funding not only for their grants, but we also need funding for educational um, events that we would uh, hold um, to be able to bring them in, um, uh, teach them a little bit about the field, and and um, and I know once they get exposed, they will be um, they'll be hooked actually. We as an organization are dealing with some issues with health disparities. Um, and um, we also are, we have a program called Women, uh, Women in Cancer Research and Minorities in Cancer Research. Um, I know you and I are both very proud of those programs. Um, uh, just curious, when you first became a CEO and kind of working your way up the ladder, was it hard being a, a woman and being a chief executive officer of probably a male dominated board and, and organization? <laughs> well, uh, interesting question, uh, Mitch. Well, uh, I think um, I was frankly very surprised that within ACR, I, I never had um, uh, very much discrimination. In fact, I mean, you know, I was in my 30s and I was asked to lead a, the most important cancer research organization in the world. Right. Um, that um, to me was already, um, you know, a, a validation uh, th of the fact that they were, were going to give me a chance. And these were um, largely um, a very senior male scientists who were right. making this decision. However, I know that other women did not have uh, similar opportunities. Now, on the outside, I remember going to a conference, um, which was a, a which had a CEO session only. And I walked in, I was the only female in the room, and, um, and the speaker announced uh, to please ask anyone in the room who was not a CEO to leave, and he looked at me. And I realized that... How dare that <laughs> <laughs> I realized that he thought I had wandered into the wrong room. Uh, so on the outside, there were, and, and, and I guess there are continued um, yeah. uh, 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 discriminations going on. But I'm very proud in the ACR that we've had the Women in Cancer Research Council and with thousands and thousands of women as members. And we actually received an award um, a few years ago for being the best organization in having w uh, women um, leaders at our board level and other, uh, other leadership levels more than any other uh, cancer organization that was, that was studied. So I was very proud of that. And uh, we, we showed that 50% that of, of the uh, individuals on our boards uh, were women. And so uh, that was really very exciting. Could you um, just just chat a little bit about? Um, we're, we're both again very proud of our cancer progress report and our our our, our cancer progress report with for health disparities as well. Um, these are l tremendous tremendous publications that we get involved with. But could you talk a little more about the importance of those two documents, if you will? Well, of course, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is very very important to us. Um, 
and uh, increasingly so. And uh, obviously, not only from a from the point of view of of making sure that we we have uh, we give grants to um, talented individuals who are minorities, and uh, and but but also um, uh, other other ways that we can train them uh, to to help the field. For example, um, in uh, we have one uh, project called Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, uh, Robert A. Wynn um, uh, program that really teaches minority clinicians to uh, to actually design clinical trials and then goes out and makes sure that in, that individuals who are minorities are able to get into the clinical trials. We're very proud to be a, a primary partner in that, but we're also uh, doing other things like the Cancer Disparities Progress Report that really highlights the needs in certain areas. That was something we started a few years ago, and it um, it is something that the lawmakers are interested in when the, when it, as soon as it comes out. So I'm very proud of that activity, as well as um, other things that we're doing to help minority investigators. And uh, we do an awful lot of work uh, uh, on in Washington D.C. with the uh, with the FDA and with others. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit more on that that work? Well, I'm very proud to say that our organization is the most active within uh, FDA in terms of of working on areas that really need attention. Uh, for example, there's one coming up called uh, the FDA ACR workshop on overall survival. It not only has uh, 200 people in person, but there are over 2,000 people online who have actually signed on to be part of this workshop. This is just one example of several things that we're doing along with the Food and Drug Administration. And um, it's thrilling because regulatory science and policy is a strong suit of the AACR. We're the best scientists that we have in the world and um, in our membership. We can help FDA and FDA will then um, be able to facilitate the approval of uh, important therapeutics for, for cancer treatment. So why do you think we're called the honest broker? Because we're honest, <laughs> but but I mean, um, uh, I think because we 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 are an organization that relates to various sectors, and we can be the catalyst for activities, and and we are always careful about um, making sure that we're not involved in conflicts of interest, uh, and we are and and to my mind, it it really works. It's thrilling to be uh, able to do that for the field. So. Um we're thinking we're getting ready to launch a new strategic plan for the organization. And I know this is a really important um, juncture, you know, for, for us. Um, why is this so important for us? And where do you see the AACR going? Well, I think that, first of all, because we are the brain trust of the field, we absolutely uh, must always be thinking ahead of the curve. Uh, we cover all the sciences from laboratory research all the way to the clinic, and now we're being asked to actually also make sure that our work gets to practice, clinical practice, which is something we haven't done before. Right. So I think we're being encouraged to really work on that, and that has to be part of the next strategic plan. But most importantly, looking ahead uh, to how we can address the field, there's always new opportunities going forward. Having uh, so many talented scientists in our organization to, be, to think through what we need to do as an organization is um, extremely important. We are now um, uh, working on the development of a scientific advisory council that will report to the board of directors on the most important um, future opportunities ahead in, in the field. And so that, that to me, um, is a very important part of the strategic plan. But there are other aspects. How much do we need to, to uh, focus on education, training, and keeping, um, and the professional advancement uh, of young investigators? Uh, where do we want to do our meetings? Uh, how much can we offer abroad in terms of our, of our meetings? And, and of course, um, uh, every aspect of our business, whether it be policy or science, needs to be examined. So I think the strategic plan will be very important in addressing all of those issues. It sounds like we're going to have to raise a few more dollars also to, to you meet will the needs do that. And, and an important 
very important part of, of what we have to get accomplished. Absolutely. I mean, all of these, whenever our scholars get together and start talking about what needs to be done, they immediately, uh, it, it immediately triggers the need for more funding. And I, I know, know that. that you'll be able to do that. <laughs> I know that you're going to do that, uh, Mitch, because you're a talented uh, fundraiser. So, so thank you very much. To the audience, uh, Dr. Foti um, was was right there front and center at the inception of Stand Up to Cancer. Uh, we are the scientific partner of Stand Up to Cancer. Um, could you just chat a little bit about Stand Up to Cancer and its importance and why we play such an important role in that organization? Thank you. Well, in uh, 2006, I got a call from Sherry Lansing, who was uh, the former uh, head of Paramount Pictures, uh, for us to be the scientific partner uh, of this important new activity. And um, the organization was founded by um, a number of women who were very passionate uh, about this um, field and the desire to really address cancer in all of its forms. And so um, we were asked to be the scientific partner and, and we were activated almost immediately. And actually, um, they are about to have a 15th anniversary telecast in August of this year, where it will be, we'll, we will be honored uh, as a scientific partner. Uh, clearly, because we are the brain trust of cancer research um, uh, in, in all the world, um, our ability to provide uh, scientific credibility to what is what is being done, to uh, provide advice on um, the scientific advisory committee, to be able to oversee all their clinical um, all their um, grants administration, um, is absolutely essential to their success. And so we are very honored. Uh, to be part of it, and we are currently talking about um, extending our relationship into the long term. That's great. That's awesome. So, so ladies and gentlemen, um, if you were ever considering investing at the AACR, after spending a few precious moments with the chief executive officer of AACR, how could you not make a donation to the AACR? Um, I, Dr. Foti um, has mentored many people. She's mentored me, and I really appreciate your support. Um, she's a strong leader, but she's a visionary, and um, the ASR is in really, really good footing. But, you know, we both agree that there's a hell of a lot more to do, um, and there's urgency out there and a need to fund cancer research. Um, and um, I just really want to thank you today oh, thank for you. spending a few minutes with us. It's, it's been a, a true delight. Um, and um, any last thoughts you, you would have today? My, I guess my last thoughts would be that uh, as, we, as we look to the future of what our organization is doing, we must uh, continue to realize that with the 200 different cancers uh, out there and the complexity of cancer, that we must continue to be fresh and innovative in what we do, and we can only do that uh, with appropriate funding. So I, I'm hopeful that the public um, will consider that and look to us for uh, major donations to, to our organization because I know that uh, they will, these funds, these precious funds, will be used uh, for the very best science going forward and save lives from cancer. Well, Dr. Margaret Foti, thank you so much for um, participating in Believe in Progress. Thank you. Once again, thank you to our listeners, supporters, and donors. Remember, your support drives the progress against cancer. Once again, please consider subscribing to our podcast, sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org, to consider making a donation. Thank you for listening to Believe in Progress, the AACR podcast. This podcast is produced by CollegeCast LLC. Please visit www.collegecastpodcast.com for more information. And don't forget, cancer research saves lives.